Oh, hey, Chris. Hey, Chuck. How are you? I'm good. It feels like we haven't been together like this in a long time. Yeah, we're back on Zoom and we have some more video to uh, to power our ever so popular YouTube feed. Um, you know, I think some of the comments are from bots, but uh, there are some really nice comments in there, too. We'll read one of them later. I love it. Yep. Um, we have both been traveling a lot. And I, I'll tell you one thing which you may or may not have heard, which I think is pretty funny, although I don't have the details. We may have to report back to the pod. Um, you know, our, our residents did their annual roast. You may yes. know more about this than I as you're laughing. So the, res, the, <laughs> the residents get together, which is a, a great um, tradition. And it's only residents and attendings, no spouses or significant others. And uh, over a couple of beers, they roast one another and, and roast us. And uh, unfortunately, I couldn't make it this year, but I heard the theme was the Upper Hand podcast. It, it, a play on the Upper Hand. Uh, so yeah, I actually have not seen it. I got a sneak preview of uh, some of the, uh, uh, some of the uh, context, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. I look forward to hearing it. The resident, fantastic future hand surgeon resident on your service right now. Uh, Dr. Elizabeth Grasser told me that she wants to have a, a personal screening of this uh, roast with uh, with you and you and me, because uh, I'm sure there'll be some kind of reaction video that'll be filmed. I am all in. I think it's very creative, uh, which, you know, is not necessarily my strength. And uh, I'm really sorry I missed it. Yeah, well, I'm, I missed it because I was uh, traveling as part of my um, ASSH Gelberman Fellowship, which uh, a trip to the Mayo Clinic, which was delayed from 2020, <laughs> only by two years because of COVID, and uh, finally was uh, back able to get back on the road. So as as we were being roasted, I was uh, sitting in a hotel room <laughs> getting ready for this trip. <laughs> and to show how kind of distant I feel from you, um, I, I only reason I knew about that was you, your post on Instagram. <laughs> and uh, so it looked like you had a good time in, in Rochester, Minnesota. Yeah, it was great. You know, so, um, you know, actually, surprisingly, when I offered um, to my wife, uh, you know, hey, I'm going to go up to Mayo um, from a Sunday to a Thursday morning. Do you guys want to come for the weekend before uh, to Minneapolis? She actually took us, took me up on that. So my wife and my two kids came to, or we all went up, we flew up to Minneapolis on Friday night and had a great time up there. Uh, ate a lot of really good food. I had no idea there was such fantastic food in Minneapolis. So shout out to anybody up in, uh, in the Twin Cities. And uh, so they took a flight home. I took a, a car to Rochester, uh, Minnesota and had a great time there. I love it. That is awesome. You guys are really good about uh, getting out there and not just uh, recovering on weekends. And you guys are really good. I, I admire how engaged you are and the travels you guys take as a family. We're, we're trying. Uh, obviously, it's been hard in the last couple of years to get out there. So it's almost like just like a lot of people around the country. It's this bolus of travel, trying to get as much as you can in. Um, uh, right now, I really feel like I need a weekend to recharge, but uh, no rest for the weary. <laughs> so what's next? Uh, yeah, so I, I am actually, I have a short work week this week. So it, uh, we're recording this in the week of July 4th. So obviously Monday was a, a holiday for all of us. And then I am taking tomorrow off. And what are you doing with tomorrow off? I don't know if I should be telling this to our executive vice chair, but, uh, I am taking a personal day because one of the tips from, uh, our partner, Marty Boyer was to really prioritize, um, your kids' birthdays. So uh, while the kids are still young enough, obviously now it's summertime and we'll be pulling them out of camp, but uh, I've taken the day off on my kids' birthdays. Wow. And what are you going to do on this? How are you going to celebrate? So on, uh, back in May when it was my daughter's fourth birthday, I, it, they both happened to fall on Fridays this year. So um, you know, I, I canceled my clinic and we had a, a daddy and daughter day. Um, we did all sorts of stuff, including the zoo and pizza and various treats of sorts and it was it was really really fun um you probably will never remember it but i have great memories and then uh tomorrow i'm taking a day off and my son has planned out an entire day and we had to whittle down the list but it includes going to the zoo going to the aquarium going <laughs> to the science museum getting pizza getting treats and i had to actually take the bowling alley arcade and top golf and move it to saturday because it was just 
too much. I was like, this <laughs> just cannot do it. I actually really wanted to put a cards game in there at the end of the evening, but my wife said she had a hard no on that one. So is Tiffany also taking a day off or is this just the dad? No, she's, she, uh, you know, this is, this is my thing apparently uh, for better or worse. So, <laughs> but yeah, so I was going to say Rafi has a, um, I guess it's not such an uncommon perspective. I mean, why limit a birthday celebration to a day? Uh, my wife has a big birthday coming up. She would kill me if I said exactly what birthday that was, uh, but she has a big birthday coming up and it's, it's not a day. It's not a weekend, it's not a week or a month. It's the year of Talia. And ah. she and and she was inspired by a good friend of ours who made it the year of David and lots of travels. So I have some pressure coming my way to be available. Yes, you do. And we have big plans. Um, we've never been to a professional tennis tournament, and uh, she really wants okay. to go to the US Open. Uh, oh. and there's some other crazy stuff. So I feel your pain, and it's a good thing. Oh. The U.S. Open is amazing. I remember going there, I think the last two years of residency in Manhattan, going out to, to, um, to Queens. And it's an amazing, I mean, if you don't have great seats, it's just such a fun experience. Um, yeah, you guys are going to love that. It's uh, tons of fun. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know that I can sit for multiple days like she can, but uh, it'll be fun. Nonetheless, it'll be fun. Well, so I'm, I'm curious. So if you have to cancel a clinic day, it actually really bothers me to cancel a clinic day. Um, especially when I, my other clinic days are already gone for a, um, uh, for a holiday. So I actually ended up putting on a clinic yesterday, which was not my normal <laughs> clinic day. And I, I our hand therapist that one of the hand therapists that works with me, she was like, remember when you just used to take a day off to take a day off? I was like, no, kind of got obligations. I kind of have to keep this thing going. So I really need to be better about, uh, truly <laughs> taking a day off and not just filling in some other time. So it's a great point for our listeners. I'd be curious if any of you guys want to reach out and share your philosophy, because like Chris, I missed my big Monday clinic. And so I thought, well, I should probably just do a quick post-op clinic today, which is Thursday. And that was the plan that, you know, like 10, 12 patients that I just needed to see. Well, that ballooned in the half day to 30 patients with a bunch of news. And uh, thankfully it went smoothly. And a, a number of surgeries came in, including some you would like. Um, but yeah, I, I what's wrong with just enjoying the fourth and not trying to make up for it? Yeah, I, 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 totally, I think it's a total pathology. So then I complain about it. And then somebody says, well, you actually chose to do this. And I'm like, <laughs> you know what? You know what? You're right. Um, I'm trying to jam a five-day work week into three days. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's busy. But that's okay. I did ask for it. Um, yeah, I'd be curious to, um, to hear what other people do. Um, I was told, I think maybe by you, that um, you know it's much easier to cancel a day of cases because it's just less people <laughs> as opposed to when you're canceling clinic. And then obviously changing a clinic has implications on your practice building, et cetera. So when you're at my phase and it's still, I think, pretty critical, um, I, I still like to have a clinic at least once a week uh, if I can, if I'm not out the entire week. Yeah. And, and look, uh, one of the other wise things my wife has is that, look, if you ask for something or you ask for a position, you know, she'll listen to me gripe occasionally or just, you know, whine. But uh, ultimately, it's, you know, we make our own choices. Exactly. Exactly. So listeners are getting insight into, uh, into who we are <laughs> and, and the decisions we make. Um, but yeah, we can, we should talk about the, the visit and the government travels at a different point. And, um, cause I think there's a, a lot I've uh, enjoyed and learned about, um, before we, we have a cool, really cool episode today. We've gotten some really great emails in the last month or so from listeners. So thank you to everybody for sending in those emails. Um, before we get into, you know, mostly non-clinical topics, I was wondering, Chuck, if there's an interesting case you wanted to share, that might be a, a nice way to get started. Yeah, I did have an interesting case and, and um, I want to just be a little vague about it, but I had a very nice lady who several years ago, I excised a, uh, a fibrous lesion from uh, the volar surface of the finger. It, it came back benign and it recurred and it was palpable, nothing dramatic on clinical exam. Um, I didn't image it, but what was interesting is it was volar, it was adjacent to the flexor sheath originally, but didn't really impact the sheath. And when she came back, you know, it was recurrent in a similar location. 
and she developed a significant swan neck deformity um, such that uh, actually um, I'm going to start that over. Interestingly, she had developed, um, no, that was right. She developed a significant swan neck deformity. I, I was, <laughs> we'll have to clean this out. Um, and so we took her to the OR and did a much more extensive volar approach. And this lesion uh, still appeared benign, was multilobular and had significantly affected the FTP tendon. It was still at least 50% intact, but it did not look good. So I had to breed it extensively. I opened the A4 and A5 pulleys, left everything else intact. Um, sent it to pathology, of course, again. And then I went ahead and treated the, uh, the swan neck deformity with a lateral band transfer, which is a procedure I love, uh, where one takes one of the lateral bands and brings it volar to the axis of rotation of the PIP joint. Uh, to help prevent that hyperextension of the PIP joint and patients generally do really well with it. So it was just super interesting and I, I haven't seen anything quite like this. I'm not, it'll be interesting to see if the lateral band transfer helps the distal joint. I think it'll help the PIP joint, but some of this is just pathology related to the FTP tendon. So super interesting. Interesting. Two things, as you would say. Um, lateral band transfer, is that better performed awake? And how instantaneously do you see an improved um, uh, improvement in at least that PIJ hyperextension? I've never done it awake. It's often in a younger age group for me and sometimes CP patients. I haven't had trouble balancing it because part of the trick is in the OR, uh, achieving a resting posture and slight flexion with the ability to passively extend fully but just a kind of spring back uh, mechanism. And then our therapy colleagues are key. And so I generally let them rest for a couple of weeks. And then at about two weeks, I put them in a dorsal block splint like we might do for a PIP dislocation. And I block them in about 10 degrees of flexion. And when all is said and done, they end up between zero and 10 degrees. It's pretty reliable, but I, I like the way you think. And I think in the right patient, that would be a good choice, the local only. Do you think that... Um... The, do you leave the DIP joint free in that dorsal blocking splint to allow that DIJ to cycle and hopefully get rid of that flexion posture at the DIJ and use those lateral bands almost like a, because it sounds like you're recreating an oblique retinacular ligament or creating one because the ORL may or may not exist. Yeah, you're definitely, that's exactly what you're doing because for those of you who aren't familiar with this mysterious anatomy of the ORL, uh, I've never seen one, despite doing lots of anatomical dissections, and an old school treatment for this was actually literally a tendon graft reconstruction. I don't think anybody, well, I shouldn't say anybody, most people don't do that anymore. Um, I like the idea, and we do get the distal joint moving early. Yes, that's exactly right. Um, what's your second point, or maybe it, oh, yeah. that was it? So the second one is, uh, how often do you image finger masses? Because this comes my way quite a bit. And if it, for me, if it doesn't look like a classic, you know, a retinacular cyst or a mucus type variant, uh, I have a low threshold to image uh, just because I don't like surprises. And I think it helps in the counseling. I, I, would, I would estimate that I do fewer than you. I don't aggressively image, especially if it seems like I'm going to be performing an incisional biopsy. So like, you know, some are classic and, and neither of us would image. I don't tend to image if, if the patient wants it out um, and it doesn't seem alarming in the, the, you know, the presence of pain or rapid growth. If those factors are lacking, I tend to just perform an excisional biopsy. If I really just feel uncomfortable, then I agree with you. Um, imaging would be helpful. In this case, it was recurrence. So I really wasn't necessarily worried about what it was. Uh, I don't think it would have changed my treatment. Um, so I don't think I missed an opportunity, uh, but it's, it's, again, a fair point. And then when do you send the specimen for pathology? Um, the only time I don't is if I, it really, unless it's a ganglion cyst, even for clear giant cell tumors of tendon sheath, I just think it's, it's the right thing to do. I don't ever send ganglion cysts, um, but I, I, I don't want to be caught without having done it. Do you have the same approach? Pretty much. If it's if you know if it isn't exactly what I expect it to be, which typically you know it's a um, ganglion type variant, I will send it. 
Um, and I have been surprised every now and then. Um, and I think it does help in counseling uh, afterwards. And I think there are obviously other reasons to do it. I want to share another quick story slash case. The case is not interesting, um, particularly, but one of our partners, and I will leave that person nameless, did a nope. carpal tunnel release. And that partner injected, and it was a wide awake, um, injected in the operating room and immediately started cutting as the patient described to me. And she was okay and you know a little uncomfortable and asked for a little more medication and, and did fine. And she really wanted to get the second side done. So I agreed to do it and uh, did what I usually do, which is what you do, I believe, which is in the pre-op holding area. You inject a little lidocaine with epinephrine and then it's the wide awake local anesthetic no tourniquet. And <laughs> she's like, this is crazy. I don't feel anything. <laughs> This Refreshing. time you let, the, <laughs> you, you let the numbing medicine set up. <laughs> it's so funny. We were, we were joking in the operating room. It was so funny. I'm like, all I care about is you have a better outcome on this side. <laughs> right. Ex exactly. For so many reasons. Uh, yeah, no, I think that the, uh, the hard, one of the hardest parts for me early on in setting up the uh, wide awake local anesthesia no tourniquet program was just figuring out how to make it work to get out to the holding area to do blocks. I mean, so if you listen to the master Don Lalonde talk, it sounds like he gets everybody there and I don't think he's doing a block. Uh, either his nurse or somebody else is doing a block and they're all just sitting there blocked like 10 or 12 patients in a row. And I'm like, that sounds great. I don't have that. Uh, and, you know, I try to do my best to have our trainees kind of focus on the surgical part of things. So just like you, I'm like doing discharge orders, paperwork, et cetera, and then going out and putting on a face out in the holding area to, you know, get everybody ready for surgery. And sometimes that includes, and many times that includes doing the block. Yeah, it, it, same, same problem here. And I usually have two or three local onlys each day. Uh, I, I have evolved, and this is a whole nother topic, but I have evolved. I push now for local only for carpal tunnels for triggers uh, those are the two that i really push on I, I i discuss it occasionally with other things but those two i push and i did not use to push i used to accept if they wanted that yeah i mean i think that uh, it, it's all about how you frame it right so the anchoring bias but i mean i tell them i do this surgery under local um and that's that's the default now, I know there are some surgeons who say, I only do it under local and I'm going to send you to somebody else if you want it done under sedation, which may be because they do it office-based, which obviously would make a difference. Um, but I don't take that hard of line. Honestly, if somebody wants to go to sleep, I'm not going to fight them on it. Um, I try to tell them that the convenience part of it, uh, you can drive yourself here, drive yourself home, no IV, no fasting. And that usually sets the stage up pretty well. But there is just some patients who are just too nervous about the whole thing. And I, I've, I used to kind of push a little bit back, but I don't push anymore. No, me either. Hey, Chris, did you notice my shirt? Oh, is that a, wow, it's been a long time. I feel like the, you know, you're wearing your Golden State Warriors shirt. And I feel like the NBA finals were a long, long time ago. Never stops. Summer league's on and it's great. But I had the, I, I feel like, I, I don't know whether I should share this or not, but hey, this is the upper hand podcast. I got to, I went to game six of the NBA finals. That's, so I, I that so uh, you haven't shared it with anybody, but uh, you shared it with me because my flight out of Providence that night was <laughs> canceled and, and I was scrambling trying to get a flight. I was like, oh yeah, I could fly out of Boston. And then I was like, I need to get into Boston tonight. How do I get into Boston? I was like, oh yeah, Chuck's going to Boston. Maybe I'll <laughs> catch a ride with him to watch the game. And uh, you had, you were long gone. So how, how was game six? Um, a couple of, uh, you know, statements. Number one, I've never seen Steph Curry play uh, in person. I'm a, I'm a big fan of his and the team and the team dynamic. Number two, uh, so I, I love the Warriors. I just like the way they play basketball. I grew up a Celtic fan. Now that's a little weird growing up in Alabama, but my uncle was a Celtics fan and there was not much professional basketball in Alabama. So it really was my two teams. And I really was hoping the Celtics would win game six, which would make, it was in Boston and it would make for a more exciting atmosphere. And then go back to Golden State and see what happens. And uh, it didn't happen that way. The first five minutes, uh, Golden State didn't look good. Boston was all over them and the, the arena was going crazy. And then it was over. But uh, even the warmups were good. It, it, was, it was really super fun. And did, really you get to catch the, did you get to catch the routine? Uh, the Steph warm-up routine? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. it was great. What, you got what there. Is, what, what's, what's the deal there about, what is that? 
I, I think it's become, it's, you know, it's become a huge, if you're a Curry and Golden State fan, then you get there early. He does, it's just really impressive shooting. And I don't know what it's evolved from, but he goes through shooting in different spots with the defender. And then one of the cooler things he does is he starts at the free, free throw line and, and, you know, every shot's a swish. And, and, uh, and then he steps back, he goes from the free throw line um, to the three-point line to maybe three or four feet behind the three-point line to uh, kind of uh, halfway between the three-point line and half court and then closer to midcourt. And then midcourt hits all those shots and then he turns it around and goes back the other way. And when I was watching, he hit all of them but one. But the skill level is just insane. He usually shoots one from the tunnel. He didn't do that uh, before game six, but he often makes those. It, it's, it's something. One, one last comment before we actually get to our topic today. <laughs> do you, you, you are old enough, uh, and I am young enough, and do you remember this? And listeners maybe somewhere in between are completely younger than me, but do you remember when MTV had their celebrity basketball game on the regular uh-huh. And one of one of the it was like crazy that you would shoot from that far back and try to make it. And now it's like totally routine. <laughs> part of the game, part of the flow. Unbelievable. Well, I'm glad you, you have your warrior shirt on. I'm sorry that your Celtics lost game six. Um, but what an incredible experience. For sure. And you've had more flight trouble than I have. Over, I've, I've really gotten lucky. And I know that our listeners will sympathize. Flying is like rolling the dice these days. Um, and trying to fly in last minute, it, it may be a thing of the past. I don't know. Well, I think I paid my penance going to London <laughs> and then on the way back from Providence because knock on wood, uh, I this is crazy, but when I was coming back from Mayo, I actually took a flight that was their first flight of the day, was going to land at nine something, and I put a clinic on in the afternoon. Really rolled the dice on that one, and I nailed it. I got home. I got home. I got home in time to uh, to get some work done. Got a quick workout in, and went to clinic. And it was amazing. That is a feel good story. If there ever was again, one. again the pathology of not being able to stop having a clinic. I don't know what's wrong with me. There we go. So, so one thing that I wanted to do is start to look through our YouTube comments, and we have a great review from. Uh, from Paul Avery Roulette, and he actually watched the episode on uh, previewing the annual meeting in which our friends Glenn Gaston and Peter rejoined us, and he says, may I quote, five stars, this is my first listen because you had my mentor, Dr. Gaston, on. I already love the flow of the hosts, and this will be saved to my Spotify for future listening. Keep up the good work. I also agree hand therapists are our biggest fan when it comes to online media from us, Dr. Roulette. So Dr. Roulette, thank you for leaving that comment on YouTube. We've actually got some more um, uh, some more great reviews on iTunes to read as well. So uh, I'm sure we got roasted on the resident podcast or the resident roast about reading our reviews. I can't wait to hear that part of it. But, uh, you know, one of the things that I did talk about when I was in Rochester at Mayo was, you know, the podcast. And it's amazing people listen and you know it's one way to reach a lot of folks and we're very fortunate uh, for people leaving reviews and giving us uh, great topics to discuss so i have a topic an email if you wouldn't mind chuck and i'd like you to answer this young hand surgeon in practice and maybe give some advice from an old man what do you think i'd be happy to after i say thank you uh for the very kind review we are grateful and chris and i sometimes have existential crises around what the podcast should look like and balance and Chris has got a much tougher gig than I because he has little kids in his life and I have old kids in my life and and uh that that is as we've said before that is our fuel so thank you yes absolutely and Chuck has the task of being the executive vice chair of a very big department so he's got a lot going on too don't uh, don't be too modest so this is a great email from um Chase Klumker and he has actually uh, list, written us before, and we know he listens. So thanks, Chase, for listening. He wrote, enjoying the podcast. What about an episode on passing oral boards? Tips and tricks, horror stories over the years, what not to do, et cetera. Just look just in time for those taking it this year. Well, it looks like that's actually around the corner. And this episode is going to drop just a week or two before the oral boards. Wow. We should, thank you, Chase. And we should have come up with that one. I was actually uh, reviewing a few cases with a former fellow. Uh, you might have done the same. And uh, it's a skill set. You know, I, uh, I've actually never examined because traditionally I go to New Hampshire uh, the last week, around the last week of July. 
Um, I think it's probably in my future because it sounds super fun, uh, but there's absolutely a skill set. And I do think there's some tips that you and I can uh, go back and forth on. Does that, does that sound okay? Yeah. I mean, so I, I took my boards not that long ago since I'm a young <laughs> ish hand surgeon um i think i took them uh i guess five years ago five years ago i think and um you know we were in person at the time and i know this year they're back in person doing uh in person exams and it seems to be at least for those taking the ortho oral boards not plastics but plastics i think is a different experience but in, in, they do this in chicago at the palmer house hotel yeah it's a it's a it's a scene it's an experience i um i am not five years out I have uh, I've done my, I guess, research uh, once, and I'm in the process of doing it a second time. So I did have to collect cases and the like, but that experience of preparing for oral boards is one that you never forget. And it's about preparation. It's about practice. It's about really mastering those cases and uh, putting the work in. And then generally the results are going to be very, very good. So um, for those of you that are unfamiliar with the process, at least in orthopedics, um, when you start practice, you've got six months to get started, then six months of case collection in which, you know, the second, uh, the last half of your first year, uh, every case gets sent, you have to send to the ABOS, the American Board of Orthopedic Surgery. And you have to list pretty detailed, uh, you know, data about, you know, the patient and what surgery you did. And then you have to talk about complications. At least that's what it was back uh, earlier. I don't know if they may have changed it in terms of what data um, you need to include. And then from, you know, that list you submit, an orthopedic surgeon actually goes through and picks cases uh, for further discussion. And then you get a list of, I think it's about 12 cases that could be brought up and you have to prepare your tail off um, and get ready to defend your actions in front of two senior orthopedic surgeons. At least, you know, I remember I, some of the surgeons that examined me are some of the names that uh, we know uh, uh, throughout our world of hand surgery. So that's the process. Um, one thing that I think, you know, this isn't going to help those sitting for the boards in the next couple of weeks, but your data collection process needs to be set from the first few months of your practice, if not from day one of your practice, um, because you need to be ready to roll when it's actually time to send the data in. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And, and again, careful preparation and I don't know the exact format today. You know, I had notebooks for each case. I don't think that's the current. It's more electronic <laughs> uh, today. But uh, yeah, you have to be prepared. You have to have all the data there. You have to look like you own the material. And that's the first step. If you look like you were sloppy with your preparation, you're behind the eight ball before it even starts. Yeah, those sharks can smell blood. It's uh, it's pretty obvious. Um, you know, so you you mentioned uh, going through cases with a former fellow. Um, I actually think I um, I'll be doing the same thing with that fellow in a, a couple of days. And you know, it's um, it's important to engage with your mentors from fellowship from training um, because oftentimes not only do you get the practice, you can blame a lot of stuff on them how they taught you <laughs> well that's one of the pearls for sure um yeah this is you can prepare on your own and you can do just fine but if you can run through cases with a mentor who has some skill with you know pimping and and really tracking down the issues identifying the issues and tracking them down with you it's there's a lot of value so let, let's let's start there let's come up with i don't know five pearls so the first pearl is don't be afraid to, of course, you want to cite the literature to defend your actions or defend your choices. But, you know, some of what we do is level five evidence, meaning it's expert opinion. And if you trained mm -hmm. with experts, you should feel comfortable saying, here is why I chose this course of action. And then, and then add, you know, I trained at Washington University. And the attendings there appreciated this approach. Now, you don't want to be arrogant about that. And you don't want to throw right. that in anyone's face. But it is a reasonable explanation if it can be defended in fact and in principle. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I mean, I think all of us rely on a lot of what we do is not necessarily based on the highest level evidence. And a lot of what we do is how we were taught for better or worse. And, you know, as long as you can um, cite that in a you know, thoughtful and gracious way, 
I think you're ahead of the game. And like you said, you want to be able to have a command of the literature, but you also don't want to throw that in people's face and come across, come across as pro professorial. Um, because again, that doesn't come across the right way. Um, you know, so I, I think that is a, an important one to, uh, um, to mention for sure. Yeah, I think the second one, and I'll just build on what you said, is humility. You know, you were going to have, in, in, they don't always pick your cases with complications, but it's not just the cases you're defending which require that we be humble. You know, medicine requires that we be humble because just when you're patting yourself on the back and thinking you're so great, you're guaranteed to get a complication or a challenging patient. But just the way you interact with questions and answers and uh, you know, admitting that you do not have all the answers and mm -hmm. perhaps you should have considered a different track uh, or different course, uh, you know, that's, that's really important because the examiners do not want to see arrogance and a refusal to accept that there is a different way that might have achieved a different outcome. Absolutely, completely agree with that. I think one pearl I would have is to be self-critical, but don't bash yourself. Um, you need to have really thought about what you could do differently, but you also, you know, need you need to own up to any mistakes that you made. Think about, you know, how would I have done this differently, even for cases that went well. Um, I always think about that. I mean, and yes, of course, during board collection and, and during your oral boards, you're going to be um, at the peak of that, but that's still something where every case that doesn't go exactly how I want it to, uh, and I, I do this as a teaching exercise too, at the end of the case with our trainees, I'm like, how could that have gone better? Um, even today, just thinking about cases, how could that have flowed better? Um, so I think being able to, you know, if somebody asks you at the end what you learned from that case, um, having some good pearls um, when you uh, when you get ready for your boards for each case. I think that's really well said. I mean, our the practice of medicine is just that, and not to get too you know philosophical, but every day is a learning opportunity for us. And if you're not trying to engage in that learning process, then you're missing an opportunity, and that can be reflected in the boards. The other, the the next pearl I would say is you know as you're preparing. So for example, there was a, a teenager with a, a distal radius fracture which was displaced a bit treated in a cast, the patient came back three weeks later and it was markedly displaced. And just the simplest little uh, decision points may not be ones that you are thinking about as, an, as a, someone who's about to take the test or, or present. And so, you know, the fellow chose to go volar and that is perfectly appropriate. But I asked why I didn't go dorsal. And we got into a nice discussion about pros and cons. And that is a very simple example but as you're preparing for the test, you know, the decisions that seem obvious to you might be different than the decision-making process for the examiner. So you have to be prepared to A, defend your choice, and B, understand why someone might do it differently. And that's part of test-taking skills. Right, absolutely. And I'd like to think that you know, all I know are the two training programs I did for my residency and fellowship, and I, at least those programs prepared me for the verbal sparring that, um, sparring is probably not the right word, but I mean, you know, that yeah. exercise of like thinking like somebody coming at you in conference and in a nice way, well, not always nice, but being able to defend your actions and think on your feet. And I think that, you know, we talk about generational differences. I admit that we are gentler in conference than we used to be. And I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, because maybe then you come across a board examiner who may not be as gentle. Now, maybe they're being instructed to be gentle, though. I don't know. Yeah. But, you know, it may not come across that way. You need to be ready to think under stress. Yeah, that's really, really well said. And what do we do when we stress? Most of us tend to just talk, right? If I get stressed, and maybe if I'm stressed because I don't know the answer, if they ask me to cite the literature and I'm not sure, most of us respond by babbling. And that's on the ward or that's in the OR or that's during a test. And so that was one of the pearls I gave to our former fellow, which is don't over talk because all you do when you over answer or try to add additional information is you give the examiner another line of questioning and you may not have said exactly what you wanted to say. And so you wanna answer questions directly. You wanna give uh, substance and you wanna cite when it's appropriate, but answer the question and stop. There's no right. crime and silence is not a crime. Right, well, I mean, it's, it's not a deposition, but you almost have to treat it like a deposition. Then most people who are in board 
oral boards probably haven't done many depots, but you know, that's the way to do it. Think about it like fracture conference. Like in most places, fracture conference was usually the way um, that type of questioning. And uh, you know, you have you don't get, don't give them any more than they need to have. They have plenty of fodder. Don't don't give them any more. So one additional pearl that we've kind of mentioned, um, but practice, like you know practice everything, be ready to, you know, have your x-rays up like it's in a PowerPoint, like they're going to essentially have a PowerPoint type program in the exam room. You'll have to work through your images, practice presenting the case, practice presenting the image, practice it on your own, practice it with other people that are taking the boards that year, and then practice it with your mentors. I remember sitting in your dining room, which I still cannot sit in your dining room because there's too many memories of um, prior <laughs> prior uh, educational experiences, to put it nicely, uh, sitting across the table for you and Marty and going through all of my cases. Um, and that was an incredibly helpful experience to me because I knew if anybody could bring out lines of questioning that were out of left field and obviously appropriate and appropriate, it would be the two of you. Um, and that was super helpful. So it, obviously in the era of Zoom and FaceTime, there's no reason you can't do a, a reasonable job getting um, getting with your mentors. I think one, you know sometimes former fellows would fly back here to do that in past years, just to like, you know, do an exam. For sure, for sure. Uh, my last pearl, you may have one more, but my last pearl is don't be defensive. All of the examiners have had complications and they've had worse complications than you're presenting, guaranteed. We all experience that. And so don't, um, you know, you have to defend your choices. Some complications could have been avoided. Many complications could not have been avoided, but don't get defensive. Be factual, you know, almost approach the case as an outsider um, so that you can be objective as you re respond to questions. And if you get defensive, that's when, again, the examiners will see the blood in the water and they'll, they'll get more aggressive, guaranteed. The last thing I'll say is something that we alluded to earlier. Um, arrive early. Arrive the night before. <laughs> don't, try to, <laughs> don't try to thread the needle. This is one in which you just have to give, give in and enjoy the extra night in Chicago or wherever you take your oral boards. And uh, it, the worst, oh, I mean, it was the worst. I remember being ushered into that ballroom and then just having to wait. That was the worst. And you get the whole talk about the ABOS, blah, blah, blah. It's, it's in, and nobody's thinking about anything else other than getting through the darn exam. Survival. So yeah, arrive, arrive early, celebrate when you're done, and then uh, cross your fingers until you get the scores back. So true. All right. Well, I, that was interesting. That was kind of fun. Yeah, indeed. So with there, we have some other listener grab bag things to get to in coming episodes. We've had some great suggestions, uh, little clinical pearls, questions, follow-up questions about uh, uh, prior episodes. So um, look forward to, to discussing those in the future. Yeah, that'll be, that'll be great. Yeah, a second part to this uh, uh, conversation would be fun, and then we will jump back in more of our routine. But uh, it's good to see you back on our turf, and uh, hopefully life calms down a little bit for you. But uh, have a good Rafi birthday day off i i hope i survive it'll be like running two rooms the pace will be fast all day <laughs> uh and, and and to anybody taking the boards out there good luck um we'll be thinking about you guys and uh we'd love to hear your experiences this year so feel free to, to send us an email or hit us up on social media so good luck good luck thanks all <laughs>